Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, let me just see. Can I go over to my screen, please? Ooh. Ah, hello. So, um, my name is George Marshall. I am the founder of a communications charity, Climate Outreach. There's a, this is our team, and we're specialists in communicating climate change. My background is actually in uh, environmental campaigning, um, but most specifically on rainforests before I came on to climate change. I spent a lot of time on the ground in amazing remote parts of the world working with indigenous groups to try and protect their land against destruction. Um, but I do have a little bit of a background in documentary filmmaking. This was an award I got for one of my pieces, the, uh, the uh, Bill Travers Insight Award for um, Environmental Filmmaking. Um, somewhat ironically, um, being a fan of, of Born Free, this of course is from Born Free, I thought it would be a really nice idea to call my uh, daughter Elsa. Then unfortunately a few years later this film Frozen came out, from in which Elsa's lead character is now one of the top five names in Britain. So I guess, yeah, I guess we're all in the shadow of Walt Disney in one way or another, aren't we? And um, certainly I can't smugly say how stupid to name your daughter after a character from a film, having, having done so myself. Um, so I do have some understanding of, of both documentary filmmaking and some of the challenges that you're under. And I come with great, I have to say, great respect and admiration for the work which is done, the work that I've seen here. I want to be clear that I come really with, with ideas which might stimulate new thought and new discussion. Uh, I know that the theme here is one of story and narrative, and I'm going to work on that, drawing from my own work on climate change. So please forgive me if in the course of this I make generalizations which, which are uh, not founded in the way that things have changed over the last few years. Uh, please correct me on anything that I might have wrong. My goal here, as I said, is to stimulate and to ask questions as best I can and from what I know. Um, I guess my, my process starts with this book which I wrote uh, two years ago. Um, like many people who work in the field of climate change, I was uh, and have been completely perplexed as to how it's possible that we know so much and yet do so little. What is this barrier between what we know and what we do? And the question in the book was, is there something intrinsically about climate change as an issue which makes it hard for us to engage with or to accept? recognizing that there are things we, we take on board and we take action on very readily, but climate change is not necessarily one. And in the course of this, I, I met quite a few people. The lady at the top is from the Texan Tea Party, very kindly flashing the gun, which she tells me she keeps down the side of her seat. Um, which, uh, and I went to ask them why they didn't accept climate change, what was hard for them in it. The, the next person now, Professor Daniel Kahneman, is the world's leading preeminent expert in cognitive psychology um, and the psychology of bias. And he is, won a Nobel Prize for his work in this field. Um, the final picture, I did a, a certain amount of field work out in areas which had had extreme weather impacts, asking people whether they accepted climate change, whether anything had shifted for them, what had changed for them. I'm not going to talk much about the book. I'm very happy to in, in, the, in the questions. I want to really jump, as it were, straight away to the conclusion. And the conclusion really is that, that information on its own, the information about what is happening, scientific information, does very little to shift attitudes. But actually, what we think and believe, and the views we hold, are really in the form of narratives, narratives that are constructed on our values, our identity, our worldview, our sense of a world as we would like it to be. That is very important as a, as a first principle for uh, natural world filmmaking. Information on itself does not necessarily change to attitudes. It can get diverted in a, in a whole number of ways. This, of course, is completely evident to us in this, Brit in this country. I imagine most of you are from Britain. Um, after the um, negotiations for leaving the European Union or staying in it, whether discussions actually, in the end, any amount of expert evidence on any side was disregarded by the other side. The entire debate was one that was concerning the values, a sense of who we are, what is important to us, and how would we like the world to be, whichever side we were. It's almost proof that information doesn't 
shift attitudes, but you can go to scientists and you could say, I'm sorry, but your science in a pure graph-driven form doesn't shift attitudes, and they still persist in, in depending on that. Um, I should stress on, by the way, on, on this point of science. Everything I'm going to talk about is very firmly grounded in empirical science, either in cognitive research or in social research. It's a bit unfortunate in the program, but this is described as, no, we need psychology, not science. The truth is, it is all science. There's a science of communications, and there's also a science to the, to the issues that we, we wish to understand. You also don't need me to, me to tell you about the fundamental importance of narrative, because your work is utterly underpinned by it in every way. You are storytellers in your work, and you know that. And that, of course, is one of the central themes of what we're doing. There are stories which are told for uh, the most um, uh, reputable blue chip productions of a kind of, of David Attenborough, or indeed for Meerkat Manor. Meerkat Manor is kind of interesting to me after I found that around the US there were uh, vigils. Uh, there were vigils after the uh, death of Flower, the uh, matriarch of, of the Meerkat, the Meerkat clan as it was presented. Four million people watched the death of Flower. It's kind of impressive. So that was generated and powered indeed by, by narrative, by, by the power of narrative. Now, we find the narratives, that the, the choice of narratives is, is not a one-way process. It's not simply a matter of having stories that go to people. As individuals, as consumers, and the people consuming your product, people choose the narratives that they want to see or hear. They then are active participants in the process whereby they absorb what is contained in that and then they pass that on to other people within their social group and peer group. Information is not a single flow from the teacher to the pupil. There's actually an entire process by which, as individuals, we take information, shape it in our own form, and pass it on to other people. When it comes to the formation of public attitudes, my concern on climate change, that process is critical. I keep coming back again and again to the two things. There is, there is the actual narrative itself and the communicator, and then there's the process by which it gets conveyed and passed around. And these, these two are, are absolutely essential. So people choose the narratives which fits with their worldview. So if you're somebody who thinks that has a, a political worldview within which uh, large corporations are, uh, are, have a potential to destroy the world through the pollution, that our lifestyles have a potential to damage the world around us, that the world is a fragile, vulnerable entity within which we, as individuals, can become too big and destructive, then climate change is an issue which readily fits with that worldview, and you're going to be quite uh, as, um, willing, willing to take it. For many people, of course, they may be uh, they may wish to see the world as intact, invulnerable, something which is beyond the reach of humans. They too are seeking out narratives to, to take on board that form. So it is not just about the story, it is the way that it speaks to who people are, their values, their identity, and the kind of world that they wish to see. Now, I have to stress that there's a very strong political component to this. Within my world of climate change, politics is the single largest determinant of people's attitudes on climate change. Nothing, nothing else is greater, not gender, not age, not education, nothing else. And that is consistent across every country that has been looked at. We have a very dangerous and poisonous polarization between left and right on this issue. People on the right are twice as likely to think that climate change is a myth as people on the left. People who are very concerned about climate change are twice as likely to be from the left wing of politics than the right wing. This is very dangerous, of course, when it comes to, to getting political action. So, I'm always looking at the way in my own research about how we can speak better to the values of people on the right, how we can try and create a, a, a stronger center ground. I'll give you an example of how important this kind of thing is. Um, landscape. This is the landscape. I live in Mid Wales. This is landscape which is just around the corner from me. To myself as, as a ecologist, I'd say a deep ecologist who spent a lot of my time in rainforests, this is a severely degraded landscape. Um, there are a lot of issues with the human impact on this space. To people who are local, deeply embedded in Welsh, in Welsh culture and community, small c conservatives, this is their essential definition of environment. Environment is for them landscape. That is why when wind farm come in, I as a defender of the global environment are keen to see us get out of fossil fuels, get onto renewable energy. I welcome wind farms. They on the other hand as a local community 
see this as a desecration of their definition of environment. So we have a situation where head to head, we are all environmentalists, but our definition of environment comes into challenge. And not surprisingly, in my own area, we had some of the most vociferous and vocal community resistance to wind farms I've ever seen. And you'll notice on that banner up there, we in mid Wales love our land. This is not nimbyism, this is not people concerned about property values, this is deeply invested in a love of environment where the conflict comes down to competing definitions of what the environment is. Like I say, we form narratives around our worldview and our identity. As a movement, environmentalism has fed this polarization. We took ownership of the issue of climate change, we shaped it in our own image, and not surprisingly, we have taken ownership, and people on the left, and the vast majority of environmentalists are, in various ways, on the left, therefore made it into a left-wing issue. These are pictures from the climate march in New York. There was nothing on 400,000 people marching, not one single sign or banner to say that people from the right were in any way welcome. Half the American population was actively excluded from the largest protest march in, in, in history or on, on climate change. So always when I see the products of the work of people like yourselves, I'm always asking how does this cut down this critical fissure, this dividing line in terms of political worldview and values, and how can we speak better to that center ground? There's another issue of climate change too, which is this one of, of psychological distancing. This is also directly relevant to your work. Professor Kahneman said when I spoke to him that climate change is a very hard issue because it is so distant in time and place. And that is true. But it is not climate change itself which is distant in time and place. It is the narrative we create around it. If you ask people, this is in America, look at the bottom lines there, the dark blue ones. If you ask people how much do you think global warming will affect different categories, you personally 10%, community 13%, People in the US, 21, 22%. People in developing countries, 31. Future generations, 44. Plant and animal species, 45. In other words, the narrative that people have constructed of climate change is one of ever-increasing seriousness with distance. Or, in reverse, we could say, ever-increasing non-seriousness with proximity. So people generate that. And people would be following that, that mark even, in my experience, when they have been severely affected by an extreme weather event, including, in my experience, talking to people affected by Hurricane Sandy, extreme wildfires flooding in the UK and so on. This is a huge problem for future generations and for other species, which of course, and you can see, varies the line. Each level of separation, a greater willingness to accept that there is a problem. Within my organization, we've tried to actually go and look at how people receive and uh, respond to different forms of images in terms of distance and proximity. We had a climate visuals project, you can see that, visuals.org. This was the first time that anyone had actually gone and tested any of this uh, work to try and find out what worked and what didn't work. And we came up with a number of principles. One of them you can see is number five, show it local. Keep it clear, keep it close. Understand your audience, respond to who they are and what they need. But one of the things that was most interesting about it, which I wanted to share with you, was that the images which are usually associated with climate change, of polar bears, melting ice sheets and so on, were in many ways really problematic. These have become the, the, well, the, the, the cliche is the poster child, which is a bit stupid if you're talking about a bear. These have become, these have become the poster bears of, of the climate change issue. And having worked for many years for Greenpeace in frustration, whenever we ran a campaign, the fundraising department would say, is there a bear in it? Because bears, bears were something which marked the identity of environmental organizations. The problem is bears are also a species a long way away. As an image, they reinforce this idea of psychological distancing. When we as a community try and communicate, and that includes in your own work, climate change around issues which are other species a long way away, we reinforce that sense of distance. And as the, the, the brilliant uh, expert in cultural semiotics, uh, Judith Anderson was talking about, um, no, sorry, Judith Anderson's on the X-Files, Judith Williamson, <laughs> duh. Um, Jim Williamson was saying, um, 
Trying to communicate global warming by showing large blocks of ice is in itself a problem. You know, there's a reason that freezers and fridges are sold with images of penguins, not ovens. And there's reasons why camels are not used in order to sell fridges. In people's minds, these things are associated. And if you show melting ice, there's no getting away from the fact you are still communicating warming with a very large block of ice. There is a cognitive disconnection which happens there, which undermines what we're working on. When we asked people in focus groups about polar bears, yes, polar bears were associated with climate change, but as you can see, with somewhat cynical sensibilities. People just go, it was a cliche, it was overused. Something I'd like you to kind of think about. These things, they might register in some ways, but just because they appear as images of climate change doesn't mean that they work. This is another theme I want to go through with you. We do not know what works until we go out and test it. We cannot assume it. Tree Media Group. So. So. I'd like to kind of summarize where we are so far. So on the basis of climate change, this is kind of a landscape that we have, which I would now like to extend to, to your work, if I may. Information on its own does little to shift people's attitudes. What is critical is the narratives that are constructed around their values and identity, where they hear it from, if they hear it from their peers. Furthermore, if they consume it with their peers, if they watch television with each other, if they do things socially with people around them, they respond together. This makes a very big difference to whether things connect with people or not. People actively choose the narratives which fit with their existing worldviews and reject the ones that don't. When something becomes packaged in a worldview which is not, worldview which is not theirs, that takes on for them an aspect of distancing, in this case, social distancing. So we have different species a long way away, but if they come with a mark of a different social group, it's, well, that's what you say, that is your thing, that is over there, this is not my concern, I don't believe it. And do not underestimate the number of people in the greater society who do not accept climate change simply because they do not accept the form in which it is communicated to them. There is a political divide, and I want to say above all, this is extremely, extremely complex. There is no straightforward mechanism by which information or the images that you might present to people convert themselves into attitudes and beliefs. There is a very complex set of pulling and, and pushing going on. So let's open up, if I may, something of, of the world of documentary making, filmmaking. Um, as a somewhat superficial uh, division, um, we could maybe talk about blue chip, a term which is familiar to you, and uh, green chip, I, uh, one of the people who've been helping to advise this talk is Morgan Richards um, in Australia, who's done some very interesting work on the way that people understand, interpret, and act upon environmental films. So Morgan talks about green chip. Let's start with green chip, the greenest green chip of all, um, which is a film made a little while ago by Leonardo DiCaprio, The Eleventh Hour. Now, what I've done is, I've, it's not a very good picture, I'm afraid, but I've kept, I've kept on it the voiceover for people uh, who, are, uh, who don't have good sight. So it's got the voiceover because it's, it's kind of interesting to hear the words spelling out the images you're going to see. I'd be interested to know what you, what you think about that. I can tell you from a communications point of view, it's deeply flawed. <laughs> it, for one thing, it shows these incessantly negative images, which we know work very, very poorly with people, unless they are that very small part of a world with a worldview which is attuned to that. But also what is interesting is the political subtext of that. Because in between footages taken from nature documentaries like your own, taken from uh, truly destructive things, oil wells burning and so on, are actually images of modernity which for many people would represent something very, very different. Freeways with cars, rush hour trains, um, are images for many people of development, of opportunity, of, of work. Uh, the images of uh, chickens on a, being, being plucked or of meat I mean very, very different things. There's a lot of assumptions in there. So in other words, that is a simply a, a, a set, a montage of images taken from an environmental worldview, a kind of like code book of environmental values. Now, as an environmentalist, I can read that code book because I'm completely fluent in those values. I look at them and go, well, yeah, I get it. I understand it. That's pretty shocking. 
but it's an example of how very, very heavily laden this kind of material is with cultural meaning, especially the cultural meaning whereby people go, no, they create distance. They go, no, that's not me. That, that's somebody else. That's what you say, Leonardo. That, that, that's another world out there because it is full of images which actually in some ways speak to people's aspirations and hopes and progress. Um, there was an attempt to make a much better film, Years of Living Dangerously. Uh, came out a few years ago. It had two Emmy nominations. Um, it made much, much better sense in terms of these concerns that I was saying. Uh, the, the, uh, the first episode, for example, started with workers at a Cargill meatpacking plant in rural Texas finding that they didn't have any work anymore because the long-term drought in Texas meant that there was no supply of beef for the meatpacking plant. I thought, wow, this is very interesting. Compared with the meat there, where it's entirely a negative image by association, this was meat as a form of employment for people, as a way of life. And therefore, the interest was in there of a working class community that was suffering because of the effects of climate change. Very enlightened, much more interesting. What was also interesting was that the film fared very, very poorly. It got awards, it got a lot of recognition. I haven't taken out James Cameron and Arnold Schwarzenegger as its, as its co-producers. And yet it didn't reach people. So something went wrong in the process. Somehow the package was not one that engaged people and the process by which they absorbed it was not quite right. There's a lot, lot more to reaching people than simply getting the message right. Um, let's, let's have a look, if we can, at blue chip work, so sort of classic nature documentary. In the course of preparing for this talk, I tried to have a look at the overview of a research about the extent to which blue chip documentary affected people's attitudes and values and behaviors. I have to say there's very, very little. It surprised me how scarce the material was. We assume, and I imagine within your community you assume, that showing people images of a natural world creates a, an, an inexorable path towards the desire to protect it. I just, I've just been watching films here just, uh, just today but that assumption is completely built into it. <coughs> Maybe there's a message at the end of saying this beautiful thing that you've seen is under threat. Help to save it. The assumption is there. I want to say we don't know, actually, how that works or indeed to what extent it does work. We can assume as somebody who's worked on rainforests for many years, I know that my concern and the concern of the people who supported me in my work was grounded in the work that you had done because they had seen, they had seen rainforests through your lens. So I don't in any way want to, uh, to, to, to undermine the power of what you do. But I do want to point out that we cannot assume that the path from one to the other is direct. And we cannot assume that there isn't some collateral damage along the way which undermines that path towards progress. I'd like to challenge your assumptions, if I may. The research which has been done has been a little bit. There was done some uh, Greek academics did some work. They showed in an experiment people um, environmental films, and then they showed some people just text on the same issue. And they found people who'd watched the environmental films or watched the, 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 the nature documentaries, say, were more concerned. So clearly it connects with an empathy. But that is hardly a very reliable sense of, of how information produces change. So one message for you is to say, we don't know enough about how the work that you do affects wider change. Therefore, we can't assume it. I'd like to talk a little bit, if I may, about framing. One of the things we come across a great deal in the area of, of cognitive, ling cognitive linguistics or in my work on climate change is the issue of framing. Framing is a means by which people make sense of a world from a socially constructed frame. The frame is a means by which in this flood, this huge amount of information, you can zero in on what is important and what is not important. Frames are socially constructed. They're created both by yourself, your worldview, but most especially the group you're in as to what is important and what is not important. That is, as it were, the frame. Frames, as we know, are essential for filmmaking. Filmmaking frames. It looks at things through a frame. It decides what to put in the frame, what to leave out. The editing process itself is framing the decision what to cut. And let's face it, nobody cuts more than uh, nature documentaries in terms of the amount of material which ends up on the cutting room floor. The decision what to include. And I'm very interested in what not to include and the effect, the extent that that has on people. 
I'm sorry, I'm slightly out of sync here. Um, we don't worry about that slide for the moment. The, as somebody who has worked all my, or, or many years on rainforests, I've become deeply concerned about the way that areas I could be working in, I could go back to 10 years later and they would no longer be there. That entire swathes of what I was working on would dis be destroyed underneath my, my own eyes. I know as filmmakers, if you're working out in these damaged areas, you too must be only too aware of the speed with which the places you're working on, the places where maybe in the course of your career you might have worked are disappearing in front of you. And yet, I, the vast majority of blue chip documentaries continue to present the natural world as something intact and inviolable and, and, and infinite. There's a fantastic essay I recommend you read by, by Stephen Mills. Stephen Mills was a, at this time or just previously, he'd been the head of the International Association of Wildlife Photographers. Making this point about how his art and the art he worked on framed out all signs of the outside world. Created a sense of, of nature as an infinite Arcadia. Remember, there are people of a worldview who are not prepared to accept that, uh, that nature is being destroyed, who willingly seize hold of this as a proof of that, of that worldview. And yet, as we know, in reality, and in reality of a large amount of filmmaking, that is not the case. But there is a, a great deal more that is going on. So I'm concerned about the extent to which the presentation of something as being intact, the framing which removes the outside destruction, which focuses on, on, the, on the one patch of what is left, may in some way be creating a false sense of confidence. There's also the concern that I would have that it becomes a kind of a relief. So rather than spurring people to action, it becomes a place where people can go and remove themselves from action, where people can find succor and relief from the destructions of the world. Um, there was a, there was a, uh, uh, yeah. Um, when you say to people, yes, yeah, so, um, Alistair Fothergill had a very interesting quote after 9-11, in which he said in, in response to his own work, People want to dig under the ground now and find a place where there aren't people. In other words, this idea that the nature films might be a place of, of relief. And when you talk to conservatives who are skeptical about climate change, they often say in, in these words, it is so arrogant, that word arrogant, to think that we can affect the natural world. So the perception they have has, has actually has two roots. A sense that we are parts of a benign, but mutually rewarding relationship with the wider world. So that's the first part of the worldview they have. And for many of them, especially in America, a faith-based belief that we are just small parts of a inviolable divine creation. When they therefore, and they are very keen watchers of blue chip documentaries, when they absorb those documentaries, it is not spurring them onto action. It is actually, if anything, reinforcing a worldview within, within which action is not necessary because everything is fine. And to suggest otherwise is a fundamental arrogance, which is a politically motivated arrogance seeking to destabilize their worldview. Um, so that's one aspect, is this issue of framing I'd like to, to make for you. Um, another, another aspect is that whether or not blue chip documentaries may induce pro-environmental behavior, such as giving a donation to uh, an environmental charity, uh, um, some form of political action, a greater level of concern, which is expressed in some way. But they can also encourage extremely non-environmental behaviors. For one thing, by actively promoting the natural world, it's very hard not to create an extremely strong background desire to go and see it. And this kind of, sort of strange climate change aberrance is appearing in many, many places. This amazingly, uh, from the travel supplements of The Guardian uh, a few years ago. Um, there's a way, therefore, that, that high quality nature documentaries are almost like trailers for the holiday. Um, take the case of turtles, for example. On the one hand, it creates, creates the backdrop within which there is this strong public demand to save turtles, which WWF, an organization I've worked with for many years, has done a wonderful job on encouraging people to, to, to save turtles. But on the other hand, 
it creates this kind of thing. This is from last year. This is the, uh, this is the turtles coming up to lay eggs on the beach amid swarms of holiday makers there taking selfies and themselves making their own little nature documentaries. Why are they there? Because of ecotourism. Why is the ecotourism there? Because in part of the background communication of the absolute wonders of this thing that they want to go and see. Again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we shouldn't make the films. I'm just saying there is a collateral damage. There is something else which happens when these things engage with the wider market. There's a, there's a sense in which people do not just want to watch David Attenborough, they want to be David Attenborough. Because nature documentaries also contain themselves a narrative of a documentary itself, going to amazing remote parts of the world and being close to those animals. <laughs> in this case, in pantomime fashion, you want to say, it's behind you. Um, with a film, this obsession we have with film, everybody has cameras, this act now of selfies, but also of compulsively recording every single thing around us so that we can be stars in our own film. So actually, to the extent that there is a, uh, there is a luxury ecotourism outfit now, which will provide you with a four-person camera crew within which you can go and star in your own nature documentary. You too can be Attenborough. Again, I'm flagging this up to point out that this relationship between image and pro-environmental behavior is indeed, is indeed somewhat complex. And then there is this. This was a... a fortunately rather short-lived campaign by Tesco's, which got pulled when they were publicly laughed at. But the logic behind it is a very powerful commercial logic, that people can, within their brains, hold on to two points of view, that they are an environmental person who is concerned with saving energy and will put in a low-energy light bulb, and that they're also very happy to be rewarded with air miles. I want to flag up for you the, the powerful concept of moral licensing. Moral licensing is a means within which we generate a self-generated narrative of ourselves as, say, pro-environmental, caring people. When we have a conflict with that self-imposed image, rather than challenging the image, we adopt behaviors which we can make, are often tokenistic behaviors, which become the license, the moral license for the destructive behavior. I mean, a classic case is a lot of this in, in, in food, for example, of uh, people you, you could see it. You could, go to, you, could go to any, you could go to any burger bar around here in Bristol, and you would find people order, ordering a double bacon cheeseburger with a supersized Diet Coke. Not a small Diet Coke, a supersized Diet Coke. And they will, in interviews, and there's been a lot of work on this, very clearly explain that the supersized Diet Coke is, is a means to actually feel good about the other, that the one compensates for the other. Moral licensing is very powerful in, in, in the field of climate change. There's a whole world of people who very, very carefully and assiduously print on both sides of a sheet of paper, change all their light bulbs, recycle, and fly. And that they, the one compensates for the other. Often these behaviors are subconscious. Uh, in one very interesting uh, study of a, an apartment building in California, people were encouraged with lovely little, little information and stickers and leaflets to um, use less water. Use less water, do your bit for the environment. And people did use less water. They used 10% less water. They also used 10% more electricity. No one had said anything about electricity. Something had happened in the collective minds of the people in that building that decided that letting go on one thing meant that they could let go, that sticking on one thing meant they could let go on another. Now, I'm flagging up for you this area which has not been researched in any shape or form but I believe it's there, which is the extent to which nature documentaries can become a social license, a, a moral license for environmentally destructive behaviors. In other words, that by absorbing and viewing and consuming a media product about the environment, you can feel that in itself is an environmental act, such that it can let you loose to do something more destructive elsewhere. We have no evidence this happens other than the fact that it happens in every other single area of human behavior. There is absolutely no reason to think it does not happen either. I'll go back to Paul Nicklin in a moment. So if I can sort of just flag up some of the points that I've made on this, just kind of sum them up. Right? First of all, I want to stress this. You should feel a huge pride in what you do. It's really worthwhile and important, and, and it underpins my work, the work of everybody in my movement, and, and, and thank you for that. Secondly, I want to say, assume nothing. 
we do not know how your products convert into behavior and attitudes. And that absence of research means that when you're doing something with the assumption that is producing change, you cannot be sure of that. And that doubt is not, to, to, it's not a weakness, it's actually a strength, because we really should be finding out and evaluating how what we do makes change. I wouldn't assume either, in the absence of that information, that we can say what form of uh, nature, wildlife, filmmaking is the best for making change or the worst. I wouldn't assume, and again, in the absence of knowledge, why say, why say anything else, that, um, that life on Earth or blue planet is more effective in producing change than uh, mere cat manor, or, um, or, or the honey bear, <laughs> the, uh, the badass honey bear on YouTube, which has had 80 million views. Um, I actually, I, I did have a video of that, but I've removed it for fear that I might get lynched by you. But um, I'm just saying, we cannot assume what, what makes the change or the other. I would urge you, though, in your communications and when you are working, to really think long and hard about speaking well and effectively to a, to a moderate, center-right audience as the key place within which attitudinal change needs to happen. Far too many environmental documentaries speak within the language and values of people of the more left liberal side of environmentalism. It is critically important that we reach wider. Um, I think the issue of framing can and should be challenged, and I know that progressive filmmakers are doing so. My view is that you should, as a matter of fact of principle, always include con content about context. Be prepared to let roads, telegraph poles, local villagers, the old tin can appear in your carefully constructed shots. It's not just about veracity and honesty, but it is about actually it is about this wider issue of not creating the false narrative which could actually undermine change. Um, and I don't think you'd even have to have a massive environmental lecture necessarily about it, just maybe being prepared to show things as they are. Right? Enormous things happening with technology too, especially with drones and so on, allowing one to show things actually within their context. Um, I, yes, I had, a, I had a picture up there of Paul Nicklin as well because I think there's a lot to be said for showing the process by which things are made. And the thing which interests me with Paul's work is that he is very often in it. He is the person who is doing fantastic, outstanding work, but he is also telling the story of his own involvement in it. And I guess in a kind of in the sense of 1960s cinema verite, I'm of the belief that the documentary film should show the active process of making the film as a fundamental part of it, rather than a sense of that one is somehow a privileged viewer in the absence of a film crew. So, I'd like to go into the discussion on that basis, but I wanted to leave you with one last thought, if I may. And I wasn't quite sure where to put this, so I actually left it sort of hanging on its own. Sometimes, sometimes, high, sometimes low art can make high art. It's, uh, it's one of those things, I'm a big film fan. And sometimes you see a film which is a lesser film which manages to say something with deep poetry. This is a film which is, I'm, I'm a, a fan of called Solient Green. Has anyone seen Solient Green? Hands up anyone who's seen this. A few of you have. Good. Solient Green has a, a scene which touches deep poetics in a way which is extremely relevant to you here. I'll explain the scene for you. It's a dystopic future within which the environment has been utterly devastated. It is so bad that there is a euthanasia program whereby members of a public are encouraged to go and die to take themselves out of a system. It's very nice when you go to a euthanasia center. It's a lovely choice of music. It's a very restful death. But the special reward is that as you lie there, you are seeing the images of the world that has gone. You finally see the glories of what went before. In other words, as people die, they see your work. I'll show you the, the, the scene and then discuss it. What's happening in here is Edward G. Robinson, I know just a little bit of film trivia, but Edward G. Robinson is uh, a, uh, an old policeman. He's decided to take the euthanasia, um, staring, staring uh, through the screen, some, some loss of memory here, is Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston has managed to break through, and he's managed to also see these images. So it was Charlton Heston we see. 
for tears, and this is a particularly interesting amount of film, for tears in Charlton, Charlton Heston's eyes are, he said, completely real, because he knew, and he alone knew, that actually Edward G. Robinson had terminal cancer and would die one week after this was made. So there's a strange subtext of this, which is that this is a film about someone's dying as they die. Now, the reason I'm showing you that is actually a really, really important and relevant one, because in its kind of prescience, the film has touched on something extremely deep, which is that there will be a time in the future, and it's coming ever, ever closer, where all of it exists of major parts of the natural world is your work. I was over the other side uh, watching the virtual reality headsets of a barrier reef. There is a point, the barrier reef is declining. It's in terminal decline, I fear. At the same time, the representations we make of it are getting ever better and better to the point now of this truly astonishing, immersive virtual reality experience. There's a point where the two are going to cross over. There's a point where the decline of a natural system is going to cross over with the quality of a reproduction. There's going to be a point at which your work becomes the barrier reef. Certainly, I can't say for my grandchildren, but certainly for my great-grandchildren, what you do will be all that is left of the barrier reef, I, I believe we can say. Maybe not. We can argue, the, we can argue the, the ecology, but I'm afraid it's looking that way. I just want to pose for you this very interesting question of what that means for your work. It's a very unusual moment in, in human history. It's unprecedented that we are doing astonishingly faithful replications of something that is disappearing such that the replication will become the object itself. And I'd like you to ponder as to how that affects what you do. Also wonder whether there is some way that the spirit of that couldn't in itself be a narrative which powers change. That the sense that the only thing which is left is going to be this film unless we do something is in itself deeply moving. And just as a final question to you, I can do no more than an open-ended question. There is something within this which speaks to our sense of death and our fear of death. Climate change too. Part of the reason we avoid climate change, I believe, is because of a fear of our own mortality in some extremely deep way. The ambiguity of the distance of, of this is part of the reason I believe why people put it into this indeterminate future space is that it ties in with a sense of a fear of our own death. Is there not a way that your work can somehow respond to that and build on it? Build on it maybe in terms of a language of, of well, here we're dealing with faith arguments, but a language of redemption, of renewal, of survival. I'm just leaving it to you as, a, as an interesting question that maybe we can explore. And thank you very much. <laughs>